We will be continuing in our theme in Isaiah, working through the book of Isaiah, our theme from ruin to restoration. And I understand that the whole Bible is God's word, that everything that is contained here is God's message to us. But there's something special about looking into one of the prophets. And Isaiah is a prophet. And, and the, the mission and the message of the prophet, the station of the prophet, and his, his primary responsibility as a prophet is to speak the word of God. And Isaiah did that. And Isaiah transcended history. He spoke to his contemporaries. His message was for those that were in captivity in Babylon. His message was relevant to even the three wise men that were following the star, trying to find that baby who they knew was in the east and they knew where to go. His message was to the disciples and, to the, and as they experienced and saw that one that would be pierced for our transgressions. And they also, the message was for the early church as well, as they went through periods of persecution. And Isaiah 55 is kind of the beginning of that whole restoration message. And that message is clearly for us today. And sometimes we fall into maybe um, the danger of sitting back and saying, well, this was a great message for the Old Testament folks. And it was a great message for the nation of Israel. And we fail to see what, how that message is a message for us today. And Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah's message is as much a message to us as it has been a message throughout all time because the message of the prophet is tested by the fulfillment and the accuracy of what he says is going to happen. And Isaiah is one of those prophets where we can see the history of his message and his prediction and what he talked about for the nation of Israel, for the early church, and now for us today. Isaiah, among other books, are, are some of the oldest manuscripts or, or, or are validated by some of the old, oldest manuscripts that were found in caves near the Dead Sea. And we are, know them as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And up in 1947, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found by a shepherd boy looking for lost sheep, it, it took the accuracy of the text of Isaiah from somewhere around the third century of Christ to a thousand years earlier before Christ. And what that means for for Bible nerds and for those that, that are interested in textual criticism is that it takes it a thousand years closer to the original manuscripts. And the original manuscripts are used to, to let us know that what we hold in our hand is accurate. And so Isaiah is one of those books that is, is clearly closest to the original writings. And so I can say with, with some clear confidence that what we are reading today from Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 12, on pages 731 and 732 in your pew Bible, that this is with clear confidence the word of the Lord for us today. Follow along as I read. Come everyone who thirst, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, 
and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live. And I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your promises that are rich in this chapter. And for the call that you have on all of our lives to come to you, understanding that you have the power and the authority and the means to meet our needs. We pray that you, we would hear your word this morning from the prophet Isaiah and that you would meet us where we are and move us to where you want us to be and help us to fellowship together and celebrate and rejoice in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So under this theme of ruin to restoration, the title to our thinking and, our, and the message today is compassion in restoration. And this compassion was expressed to Isaiah's contemporaries, as we've already said, to those that were experiencing exile and to the wise men and to the early church. And now it's being expressed to us. And this compassion is for all who are on that journey from ruin to restoration. And doesn't that include each one of us? Don't we journey on a road from ruin to restoration. Initially in our separation from God and our sin, that is the reality of all mankind. But even when we enter into that relationship with God and, and we are working hard at following him, we experience those, op, those times of ruin and we need to be restored. And God's, com God's compassion is at the center and at the heart of that restoration. And this compassion is demonstrated by God through his open arms. First, his open arms to be satisfied in verses 1 through 3. He says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come, buy and eat with no money. Come, buy milk and wine without money or without price. Drink, eat, and be satisfied. Is it any clearer that God is opening his arms to us and saying to us, 
come. He's not saying fix it before you come. He's not saying get your act together and then come. He is with open arms reaching out and saying, everyone who thirsts, everyone who thirsts, come. The clear message is his open arms to come and be satisfied. In verse 2, he, he challenges us. And in, in, and in my paraphrase, the question is, why do you spend money on things that do not satisfy when I can meet all your needs? It's a good question. Why do we spend time and energy and money on things that don't really satisfy when everything that we need and everything that we can have to be satisfied in soul and body and spirit is wrapped up in our relationship with God? Why do we spend so much time and energy and money on those things that do not satisfy? Is it pride? Is it lack of focus? Is it lack of trust? Or is it just pure ignorance? God calls us with his open arms to come and be satisfied. In verses 3b through 5, he calls with open arms for us to enter in to a covenant with him. God's open arms are an invitation like the covenant made with David that made him a witness to the people, a leader and a commander. David came from ruin to restoration by the power of the Lord our God, the Holy One of Israel, who glorified him and that same power and authority and covenant relationship is completely available to us. Covenant is the heart of our relationship with God. And that covenant in, in many different periods of time, but the, the core of that covenant is that God says, he will be our God and we will be his people. We call ourselves covenant partners here because of that. Our purpose is to know and understand that, that we are in a relationship of covenant with God and with each other. And focused on the heart that God is our God and we are his people. We are a part of the evangelical covenant order of Presbyterians. That is by design. Covenant is our DNA. It is at the core of our reformational roots. The covenant of God that declares God to be God and us to be his people is at the heart of everything that we are and everything that we do and everything that we want to do. In verses 6 and 7, he has open arms for forgiveness and renewal. His open arms for forgiveness call us to repentance. And we, when we come to him with broken, repentant hearts, he welcomes us with his loving compassion and his abundant pardon. Repentance, forgiveness, and renewal, renewal are all integral parts of our walk and our relationship with God. You've probably heard me talk about an intentional, intimate, and obedient relationship with Jesus Christ. Outside of a personal relationship with Jesus, there's no forgiveness and no renewal. Jesus, through the power and authority of his death and resurrection, 
broke the power of sin and death and calls us through his Holy Spirit to come to him for renewal and regeneration. It's all about what Jesus has done, not what we can do ourselves. I don't know if you were here when when Pastor Bob had us repeat several times, I think it was an Easter Sunday, when he said, now is the time. And we said, today is the day. God says to us through Isaiah, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him when he is near. And I believe that God is nearest to us when we come to terms with our brokenness and open our hearts to his restoration. You can call upon his name today and enter in to that relationship with him. I will never forget the day that I knew that God was calling me. And he was tugging at my heart and I responded to his nudge. And at the age of 13, I surrendered all that I knew of myself to all that I knew of God. And we have been walking together on my road from ruin to restoration ever since. And sometimes that road is rocky. And sometimes that road is paved. And most of the time it's, 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 it's all a part of my willingness to trust him. My willingness to follow him. My willingness to be obedient to him. God's open arms also reach out for us to surrender to his sovereignty in verses 8 through 11. God declares his sovereignty and invites us to trust in his control. And just as he replenishes the earth through the snow and the rain, he wants to replenish our lives through every word that comes out of his mouth. And I like where he says that, that it, will, it will accomplish the things for which he purposes. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Because he is, contr- is in control and he is our sovereign God. I believe it's easy to stand on the foundation of God's sovereignty when everything is going well. When things are happening the way I want things to happen, when people like me, when I'm being productive, when I'm experiencing good relationships and good health, it's easy to say, I believe in the sovereignty of God. But let something like the coronavirus creep into our world. Something like broken relationships. Something like confusion of of my understanding of what God wants for me. Then it becomes a little bit harder to stand on the sovereignty of God. But he is no less sovereign in times of comfort, in times of strength, we really need to reach out and understand his sovereignty deeper when we are in turmoil, when we are in ruin. And over the last eight weeks, I've witnessed the power of God's grace through his word and his sovereignty in the lives of folks that have responded to grief share ministry. We've just started and we were eight weeks into it. And I would encourage you if you have gone through loss or if you feel God calling you to come along beside people who have gone through loss. Because I'm beginning to see again firsthand that there is nothing more tragic. There is nothing more more confusing. There is nothing that kind of has us question the sovereignty of God than the loss of someone that we dearly dearly love. 
And a few weeks ago, uh, th- two or three weeks in, we had a group of almost 14 people on a Wednesday night. And these folks learned about Grief Share through a national website and showed up here. So this is clearly an outreach. And I'm not saying this to, to, to say the wonderful things that we're doing. Yes, it is something that, that I see great that is happening in our church. But I went away from that night praying to God on my drive home and saying to him, I can't bear the burden of this. I'm overwhelmed with sitting with 14 people who are hurting and moving, wanting to move forward or maybe stuck or just trying to sort it out and trying to understand the sovereignty of God. And in my drive home that night, somewhere between uh, Hildebrand and Bitters and and 1604, God said to me, you know, you're right. You can't do this but I can and get back in the game, get out of yourself and become a part. Let me allow you to be used as an ambassador of my grace and peace in people's lives. And I have seen over the last eight weeks in the hearts and lives of folks that have, have experienced the greatest tragedy tragedy and fallen into the deepest, darkest ruin, be encouraged by the sovereignty of God and hearing his word strategically placed in their lives at a point where they desperately need to hear it. And I've seen the power and authority of his sovereign grace in their lives. Now, they haven't gone away after eight weeks and say, oh, I'm great, I'm moving forward um, you know, I, I'm not even hurting from losing my life. No, that doesn't happen. One of the testimonies is that as I have pursued God, I don't know that I've gotten the answers to my questions about why, but I have gotten peace in my heart as I've pursued him. That is the power and authority of his word. That is his arms wrapped around us to celebrate his sovereignty as we move forward. And I would encourage you to look into Grief Share. And if you feel that that you would want to be a part of this ministry, please talk to me. And I don't mean this as, as a commercial, but maybe it is. But this is an opportunity that is an outreach that is happening right now, along with a lot of other things that are happening. And it has encouraged me and changed my understanding of the sovereignty of God and helps me to speak that truth that no matter what we are going through, we can trust that God's grace is sufficient for us. And I believe that that's the message of 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 God's compassion that we find in Isaiah 55 of his reaching out with open arms inviting us to come to him to come to him and to experience the satisfaction of our soul enter into a covenant relationship with him and experience forgiveness and renewal And open ourselves to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that carries us along our road of ruin to restoration. And then rest in the sovereignty and truth of God. My ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And do we trust that? And can we rest in him? And then in verse 12, as we put that all together for ourselves in entering into what it means to have that intimate and intentional and obedient relationship with Jesus Christ. And when that becomes real to us and when we, when we grasp on to the fullness of God in our lives, It's a cause 
for celebration. There is a reason for joy, peace, and rejoicing. And if we don't do it ourselves, the hills and trees will do it for us. The question is, do we or how do we celebrate God? Now, I've been here for almost four years, and you probably recognize by now that I'm kind of a flatline personality. I'm usually right here. Now, inside, I could be way up or way down, but what you're going to see is this flat line. Uh, you don't know how nervous I've been all morning. And I had someone come to me one time and say, do you have a pulse? And I wasn't sure whether I should take that as a compliment or whether he was saying, you need to go to the emergency room right now and call 911. But I will admit that my family often is confused and trying to understand where I am. And I, they have challenged me because, and I think this is, is not very nice anyway, but they have said to me, that you show more emotion on Sunday afternoons watching the Philadelphia Eagles play than you do in other circumstances of our lives. Now, I do have to confess, on that Sunday of Super Bowl 52, near the end of the fourth quarter, when Brandon Graham rushed in and knocked the ball out of Tom Brady's hands, I was sitting on the couch and I jumped up with a two-fisted yes and scared everybody in the house. <laughs> and I am challenged today because why don't I have that same reaction? And why didn't I have that same reaction? When I said to you, through the power and authority of his death and resurrection, Jesus broke the power of sin and death and provides us with that power and authority for forgiveness and restoration. Shouldn't that have a, a more overwhelming two-fisted yes? And when we sing the Gloria Patre and when we when we say the Lord's Prayer and say, you know, your kingdom come and by the power and authority of you, when we talk about the power and authority of God in our lives, do we get excited? I do get excited, but maybe you don't see it. And I think that we all have to kind of understand that, that we all have different levels of, of, of praise and celebration. And we all have different postures of praise. And we can't assume that because someone doesn't have the same posture of praise as we do, that they're not experiencing that celebration in their own lives. And what I would like to, to propose to us and to me that we identify our posture of praise. Because it's in that posture of praise, it's in what we do here on a Sunday morning and we take a look at Isaiah 55 and understand that there is a lot of celebration that we need to be doing. And my posture of praise is normally my hands in my pocket and I'm rocking on my heels. And even if it's a song that I really know. And it was difficult for me even coming here to raise my hands for a benediction because that is not a part of who I've ever been. And I'm, and I'm being challenged by that. But I know what my posture of praise is. And when I'm experiencing that, it's between God and me. And I can say to you, raise your hands and, and, and praise, but if, you're not, if you can't do this, maybe it's this. Or maybe it's this. Or maybe it's grabbing onto the pew in front of you and putting your head down or putting your head up. 
identify your posture of praise is all that I'm trying to say. And then as we experience the, the, the good news of God's open arms to us and the good news of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we need to praise him and need to find that posture of praise. Because in praising him, we come to that point where we are motivated and challenged to share that with others. What is your posture of praise? Do you know it? And does God know it? And do you practice it? And does it empower you to share his compassion with others? The road from ruin to restoration is paved with the compassion of the Lord our God, the Holy One of Israel, opening up his arms to us and inviting us to come. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you reach out your arms to us. Help us to be willing and repentant and understanding that that's the place that we need to be. Help us to fall into your arms, coming to you for all that sustains us, coming to you for repentance and restoration, coming to you for direction in everything that we say and do. Go before us today. Help us to rest in your sovereignty and walk with us every step of our road from ruin to restoration. In Jesus' name, amen.